Welcome everyone to the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt Jr., Senior Account Executive at Sales Gravy. And before we get started, uh, I want to introduce you to one of our great partners, Scipio. They are a text messaging platform for salespeople. They ha- allow us to be automated at a scalable level and personable. I- I'll tell you this, I've sent out nine text messages this week and gotten four appointments within two hours of sending those text messages. So check out Scipio, that's scipio.com forward slash sales gravy. Uh, and so today on the podcast, I've got an awesome, awesome, awesome sales person, sales influencer, sales author, Mr. Lee Sales. He's written this book right here, Sales Sell Different, which is a follow-up to sales differentiation. And I've got uh, a conversation that I'm really excited about with him. But Lee, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our audience? I think you did a great job with Jeb. Uh, I am Lee Sales. I'm a sales management strategist. I've written uh, six books, including with Jeb Sr., uh, we, we've done some projects together, and my most recent book, as you touched on, is uh, Sell Different, which is the second in a series following sales differentiation. Fantastic. Well, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I read this book a couple of times. So this is my, I, I read it last night, and I read it a few weeks ago, and there's a so lot of- ready for the test. Yeah, I'm ready for the test. I was, <laughs> I was writing notes. I was getting things down because there's so many different strategies that you outlay in this book, and uh, I kind of want to start with, you know, one thing that I hear as you know, as a sales trainer and one thing that we hear from salespeople all the time is, you know, if our prices were different, if our prices were more competitive, then you, you, we'd win a lot more deals. And so you know, why is that a fundamental flaw in sales? So when we think of price, whenever there's pushback on price, salespeople get really defensive and, and they do, they go back to their executive teams and say exactly what you just said. Instead of taking it as constructive criticism, When someone pushes back on your price, what they're really saying is the price that you put in front of them is not commensurate with the value you've demonstrated thus far. And there's two ways you can demonstrate value. There's positioning what you sell and how you sell. So for example, in sales differentiation, I got into differentiating what you sell and how you sell and then sell different adds a new dimension to that. Gotcha. And I, you know, that's something that when we talk about selling in, in the current environment, I, I mean, I don't think this has not been true. It's been true for decades. It's been true in every industry. I mean, even going back into the 1800s, right? Like products, <laughs> unless they're I'm inc- not that old, not that old, well, you're close, but not that old. Right. So, you know, products over time in marketplaces become the same. I mean, it's really hard to see differences unless it's a really innovative space. I mean, you know, we had the, we had tech space come up in San Francisco in the last 25 years, and there was a lot of differentiation there. But now you look across the board, these SaaS companies, they all sort of look and sound the same. So, you know, we talk about primary decision makers. It's, usually less about the products and the, you know, the, the, the kitchen sink you can throw on on the features. So what is it that drives decisions for decision makers in your opinion? Well, let, let's stay on that price piece uh, related to that. You know, one of the biggest reasons why the price issue comes up is we're playing a game we shouldn't be playing, meaning that we don't have clarity on our target client. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. I thought it's called an ideal client. It's not, and and this isn't just wordsmithing. If you think of what an ideal client profile says to salespeople, it says, if all the stars were to align, this is the business we'd love to have. It's like buying a lottery ticket. It's a one one in a million, one in a billion chance, right? But a target client profile says, this is who will perceive meaningful value in what we offer. And that's what we should spend every selling minute of every day going after those opportunities. So it's very different than what the ideal client profile says to them. Jeb, do, does your audience like free things? Well, they like free things, but do they use free things? <laughs> that's that's the well, question. Let me there. give you one. I'm gonna. I got a tough URL for you. You ready? Okay. Targetclientprofile.com. If you go to targetclientprofile.com, you can download a template that will have, help you have laser focus on who will see meaningful value in what you're selling. But that's really the key. You know, you know, we talk about buyers being hypersensitive on price, right? And we, we almost say it as like a criticism. Well, they're, they're really focused on price. But if you think about it, none of us wants to pay one penny more than we have to for the solution that we want. And if we see two things that are identical, at least our perception is that they're identical. We're not going to pay one penny more. 
So that burden is on us to demonstrate that meaningful value. And it could be the lowest rung in the decision influencer chain all the way into the C-suite. We want to understand that meaningful value. And you'll notice I keep saying the word meaningful. What that means is that you have to understand who you're interacting with because what's meaningful to one individual is not going to be meaningful to another. That takes into account industry and it takes into account level in that organization. That's a, it's a really important point in your book that you make when you talk about the, you know, when you're talking about what you're selling, you are missing the most important piece of the sales process, which is really who you're selling to. So I like diving into the targeted versus ideal, you know, decision maker, right? Those are two different categories. And I, I, the free, I, go check out that link. It's, it's really powerful because it allows you to understand who you should be selling to more. Let's, let's stay on this topic a little bit because I think it's something that as sellers, we miss a lot. I'll, I'll tell you this, so many companies, many salespeople I talk to, they, you know, they take on anybody they can and they just say yes to anybody they can. And it comes into a category where they're just stressed out all the time because they sold something, but someone didn't see the value in it. Maybe they were the cheapest price or maybe they had a high price, but they weren't the most valuable for their customer. And so, you know, how, how can you, how do you strategize around finding ideal versus targeted accounts for your business or for the businesses you work for? That's a great question. So we look at that target client profile There's actually nine categories in it. And it requires a few things. One is to really understand what you're selling and what the alignment is with the marketplace and then taking a step back and saying, what is this spectrum of decision influencers that are gonna be involved? So we talk about a decision influencer, that refers to anyone and everyone who has to turn their key and say, yes, I wanna do this for this deal to happen. And as we know in a business to business setting, that requires multiple people. It's not usually one person that says yes and you, and you get the deal. So having clarity on that spectrum of decision influencers and figuring out who will perceive what meaningful value? Because you may offer all these different things, but this particular individual sees value here. This one sees value here. This one sees value here. I'll give you an example. Let's say we sell copiers for a living. And Jeb, today's a very exciting day. You know why? Why is that? We have just produced the first copier on the planet, the first one anywhere that can print 50 shades of gray. That's really interesting. 50 shades of gray. That's, that's incredibly interesting. Isn't Why interesting? do I care about 50 shades of gray? Well, this afternoon you have a meeting with the CFO to talk about this new copier. You're going to be talking about the 50 shades of gray with that CFO. Gosh, I hope not for so <laughs> many reasons, but most importantly, CFOs don't care about colors, shades, and hues. They care about the financial impact it can have on the business tomorrow. You've got a meeting with a marketing manager. Doesn't care so much about the financial impact, does care about color, shades, hues, the overall performance of it. Tomorrow afternoon, you have a meeting with an IT manager. Doesn't care about financial impact. Doesn't care about color, shades, and hues. Cares about reliability, maintenance. We haven't changed the box of what we're selling, but the conversations are very different based on who we're interacting with. I'm working with a large steel manufacturer. They're going through a sales differentiation program with me. And they, they just went through this whole exercise where we've profiled decision influencers. We've understood the competitive landscape. We've gone through each of their differentiators. And then we went through what I call the big three. Because you can't talk about everything that your company does in any given meeting, nor would you want to. So if you can only position three differentiators when you're meeting with this particular decision influencer, which three would it be? So we put this matrix together. What was really interesting was how the matrix was so different for each one of the decision influencers. And the leadership team, after we went through that, was just brought up points as I can only imagine what our salespeople have been doing thus far, because we haven't had enough sensitivity around the conversation we're having based on the individual that we're meeting with. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's it's right. It's emotional outcome and business outcomes that you have to focus on and different pro buyer profiles. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, 
we found over the last 10 years through one of my, one of my clients, one of my partners, ADP, that uh, decisions are being made 70%, you know, the, the amount of folks in a decision-making process has increased by 70%. Just the other day, I had two conversations with two separate companies about training that was happening two months from now, and I had five different people on the call, all with different roles, all influencing the decision. And as a salesperson, you have to be agile in how you understand their needs and their goals. Now, one thing that you talk about in your book about differentiation is un- you know, understanding what big three differentiators you have and, and, and going through that process. But another piece is passion, right? So the passion for what you sell is such a big piece of your differentiation. So what are some mindset strategies that you've been able to uncover with different clients and, and, and for yourself? Well, I'll tell you, one of my favorite mindsets that I talk about, and it's in the book, is the business developer's mantra, which says very simply, every deal must yield two more. Every deal must yield two more. And so if you think about most salespeople, when they win a piece of business, it's good news, bad news, right? The good news is I just got the account. The bad news is my pipeline is now barren because something came out the other side. But if we have that mindset, every deal must yield two more. Now we look at a compounding effect. Okay, I landed this account. Now I got to squeeze all the juice out of it. So I'm working with uh, a sales rep right now, doing some coaching with him. And he, he's brand new. He's, he's just out of college. He's been with this company a short period of time. And he's starting to land some accounts. And I, and I said, how hard do you want to work in sales? He goes, well, I think you always have to work hard in sales. I said, fair point. Do you want to work smarter or do you want to work harder? He goes, I want to work smarter. I said, well, every deal you bring in, if we can get it to yield two more, think about the compounding effect on your results and most importantly to you personally, to your income. So we forget about things like referrals and upsells and cross sells. We just move on to the next opportunity. But if we say we always have to squeeze all the juice out of every deal that we bring in, every deal must yield two more. It creates a totally different mindset and it's game changing for salespeople. I, I, I love this and I, I'll speak from experience. I, I, I'm not fresh out of college. I'm fresh out of college, but not as fresh out of college. So I've been in sales for now for two, for going on two years. And one of the challenges I struggle with as a new salesperson is that I hunt what's in front of me and salespeople are like water. They find the easiest path. And in our minds, the easiest path is to close that deal and then go find the next thing to close and hunt it down. And we leave that relationship in the past. But I like what you said, work smarter. I mean, you can work, you have to work hard, but you have to work smarter. So one Think about that just from a, a you know, smart working perspective is that you can squeeze three deals out of one, meaning that you have you know longevity with a relationship, you have more income in your pocket. It's probably an easier sale because one, you probably got set up as a vendor or you have a relationship with a decision maker who can influence other decision makers and you're already providing a, an ROI for them. So you don't have to go through that process again. At the same time, think about as a salesperson, we're talking about Larry Levine, right? You guys met at Outbound. Oh, yeah. And, sure. you know, think about your mental health, right? Like as a salesperson, if one thing that I found is that if I have a deal and I have a great relationship and I work with them over and over and over again, filling the pipeline as I should, I just feel less stressed out because I know who I'm speaking with, right? So that's a really great mindset. What is it? It that- works. It works. I mean, when you, when you have that mindset and you apply it, and, and I have some... Uh, some folks that have actually printed it out. I've created these posters around and actually have it printed out to keep it in front of them. Because exactly what you said, you bring in that new account and it's not entirely the salesperson's fault, right? The the management team is always saying, okay, what new logos or what new banners do you have for me? And we forget to squeeze all the juice out of that one deal that we brought in. So for speaking on the, the, the person that you're coaching, cause I, I'm, I'm a young salesperson. I'm always interested in what I can do better other, you know, other than two deals, you know, from one deal, if I, if I close one, I need to get two out of it. What are some other mindsets or just some strategies that you would implement if you were 24, 25, starting out your career that um, maybe you identified and, you know, sell different that would, would apply really well for those folks. Yeah, so another one that we've been talking about is you've got a very big territory. I don't don't know how you're structured with your territory, but if they cut his territory by 90%, he'd still be swamped for the next 10 years. That's how big his territory is right now. And he's spending a day over here, a day over here, a day over there. 
And, and I said to her, I said, did the company give you a mandate that said you need to spend this amount of time over here? They said, no, they just said, here's your land. I said, so let's figure out where you can be most successful. So this is actually in the garbage space. See, Minnesota's got a lot of idiosyncrasies to it. And one of the idiosyncrasies is in most of the counties here, every homeowner and every business contracts for their own trash removal. I'm guessing where you are, there's a city contract that yes. just shows up, right? Right. That's the case with most of the country, not here. So on Wednesday mornings, there's literally a parade of garbage trucks coming down my street representing every hauler you can imagine because everyone has their own their own deal so what he started to recognize is there's a couple of haulers that for him are low-hanging fruit that if he finds out they're using them he can clean their clock all day long and i said all right so remember we, we i asked you about smart and and working hard do you get paid for work and he thought about it and he goes no i don't so what do you get paid for results Right. right. So where can we get the best results? Well, anytime we see this logo or that logo, we know there is a high likelihood that we've got a story that they're going to find compelling and they'll switch to us. I said, so let's forget about the geographic territory that you have and let's be account specific. Let's go after the ones we have the greatest likelihood to be successful. And all of a sudden he had uh, five new accounts last week. Wow. Yep. OHR performers are are just so focused on being in the position of the highest win probability, right? So Jeb Sr. says it all the time. It, it does you can work all day long. Like I have clients who will spend all day, they'll call they'll they'll, look, they'll come to me and say, Jeb, we call a hundred people a day, a hundred people. We're picking up the phone and dialing and we get no appointments, nobody's picking up the phone. First question I'll ask them is, you know, how many times you pick up the phone? Well, we yeah. called them one time. It's like, well, of course, if you call them one time, they're not going to pick up the phone because they don't know who the heck you are. And the other thing is, you know, if you're calling 100 people, you're probably not calling 100 of the right people. You're just throwing spaghetti against the wall and hoping something sticks. Yeah. It dawns on me that as we're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about the title of your book, Sell Different, which means that there is a way of selling that you want to be different from. So, uh, Dive into your title a little bit there, because I want to. I just want to uncover awareness for the folks who are listening to this podcast. Yeah, so the idea of sell different. Now, I've had a few English majors say, shouldn't it be sell differently? And the answer <laughs> is no. It's actually a double entendre. So it's saying that you need to sell different in the way that you're going about it, but also the messaging that you should be having around that is sell different. Now, you asked me about some things that I find make people successful. So let me ask you this question, because you're, you've are you been at sales now. You said two years. You just lied to your audience, because I know who you live with. Right? <laughs> I know your dad. You've been in sales a lot longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I've been, I've been I've been in sales for my entire life, but I, I, I just Thank denied you. it. for that's, I that's denied it until the last two years. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Is sales a numbers game? It is a numbers game. It's a science and an art. So it's 100% a numbers game. Yes, has a number. Okay. I am going to somewhat disagree with you. Okay. I believe that numbers are a part of it. But if we exclusively look at sales through the lens of numbers game, we treat people like a number. Right. And that's the problem with that. If we only say it's a numbers game, we treat people like a number. And nobody wants to be treated like a number. We forget to make people feel special. And that's when we talk about one of the themes in, in Sell Different is recognizing the importance of making every person that you interact with feel special, not like a number. Yes, you need to have certain numbers, and I, I get the equation, and I subscribe to that. But that's not the only lens that I see it through. See, if you think about it, on any given day, Jeb, how many, how many prospects do you think you talk about on any given day? How many talk do you talk with? Mm. 10, 15, 20? Yeah, 20, 20, 25, something like that. Okay. How many conversations did they have with Sales Gravy? Probably one, yeah. One, <laughs> one with Sales Gravy. Right. They had so 100 with had, other folks. Yeah, so you may have had a repetitive conversation right around the various training offerings that you offer right. 25 times that day. They only had it with Sales Gravy once. Yes. So that conversation needs to be like you've never had it before, meaning it's fresh, that you care, that you know something about them, 
right? And that's the, that's the mistake that so many salespeople make. It's just another call. It's just another email. It's just another proposal. It's just another presentation. We forget to make people feel special. And I'll tell you what, that sells. When people make, when you make people feel special and you show that you care, you stand out from all the other salespeople that are calling on them. And then they want to do business with you. Absolutely. The, as a salesperson, your competitor is every bad salesperson that has ever called that person. You're competing against the status quo. And really, if you can win just by being a little bit different by caring to caring enough to care. And you know, that's, in, that's in a, your travels with your folks. Did they ever take you to a Broadway show? I've never been to a Broadway show. I've been to New York several times. And that's one thing that I haven't been able to do. All right, we'll put that on your list. So a Broadway show is usually delivered twice a day. And the actors are in that sometimes months, sometimes even years in that same role. They're doing that show repetitively, but what they recognize is the audience sees it once. And they have to create an experience that they come away with just blown away by that show. And that's the same opportunity. I don't care what you sell. I don't care to whom you sell. Everyone watching this podcast has that opportunity to make people feel special. The number one predictor in sales is how, how well your customer experience was and you know how much they liked you, how much you listened to them, how much you made them feel important. Those are the predictors in sales. Numbers is really important. I agree with you. I think numbers are really important, but if you just if you distill it to numbers, then you're really missing out on the art of sales, which you know happens when you are creating an experience that you know, other people just simply don't. And that's just because, again, they're repeating it. Like you said, Broadway show, they're doing it over and over and over again. Absolutely. And they go, well, it's just another call. But really great salespeople understand that this is, like you said, this is one conversation they have with you every, what, month, week, every mm -hmm. other week. It's really not all that often for them. So uh, tell me a little bit more about the buying experience strategy. Since we've been talking about this specific area, let's dive into that strategy specifically. Well, before we started the show, we got into a little bit about college baseball, and I have two sons that play. And in, in the first chapter, Sell Different, I tell the story of when my son, Stephen, was recruited. Uh, you know, when he was in high school, he had aspirations of playing college baseball. And in between his junior and senior years, he was asked to play on our American Legion baseball team. And in the course of one week, he had four home runs and three doubles. Now, we had been saying, hey, Stephen, you need to set up college visits, set up college tours. And, and, and Jeb, maybe you were a little better at it, but he was a little slow in getting those things scheduled. <laughs> I but believe the fifth. the equation changed. All of a sudden, the schools were coming to us. We didn't have to call and schedule any visits. They were recruiting Stephen. Now, if you've ever been through a college recruiting experience before, you know it's a sale. These coaches are trying to sell you on their institution, but – they can't differentiate what they're selling. They can't add a major or build a dorm, move the campus. They can't change the menu in the cafeteria. Those are all fixed assets. But what they can do is differentiate the way they sell. They can sell different. And the way that they do that is around the experience that they create when they're recruiting. And I got to tell you, some coaches were absolutely fantastic at it, and some failed miserably. Now, you know when you first – drive onto a college campus, as soon as you cross the border, your blood pressure jumps about 30 points. <laughs> you know why? It's not the tuition. You can't find a place to park. <laughs> Every parking lot on a college campus is park here, and we're going to tow you, but welcome to our fine institution. Well, this one school we visited, we pull into the parking lot, and there's a spot with Stephen's name on it. Stop wow. just dead in our tracks. Then we go inside. There's an agenda printed for the day. Stephen's name right at the top. What did it cost that institution to do those two things? A penny, maybe for the ink and the paper. But what did they do? They created an experience. They made the entire family feel special. They made us feel like he was the only athlete they were recruiting anywhere in the world for any sport. Of course, that wasn't the case, but that's how they made us feel. It's Another school we visited, rainy day, and the coach said, hey, when you get here, text me, and he did. 
three assistant coaches come out with golf umbrellas, escort us into the facility. We sit down with the head coach. He says, I hope you don't mind. I didn't invite admissions today. I'm going to take you on the tour. I spent four hours with us that first day. Wow. Now, when, when you got accepted to college, Jeb, how did you find out you were in? I believe the the person who was recruiting me, the uh, the admissions counselor, gave me a call in the middle of uh, in the middle of class and uh, and and let me know on the phone that I had gotten accepted. That's rare, isn't it? That's yeah. not the way most get, most people find out, is it? They get a letter in the mail. Yep. And Stephen, just like you, he got a call from this head coach saying, "Welcome to Augsburg University," which I'm proudly wearing today, and he accepted. And if you think about what these coaches did. They created an experience. Now, there were seven schools that were recruiting Stephen. The one that was on the top of his list, bags packed, this is where I'm going, was at the bottom of the list at the end of the process. They didn't get rid of a major. They didn't knock down a dorm. They didn't move the campus. It was the experience we had in recruiting, how we were being sold. They said the words, hey, we really want you here, but the actions didn't support it. How bad was the experience? So my other son, David, a nationally recognized pitcher, when he went through the recruiting process, that school wasn't even on his list. So when you make someone feel like a number, you don't just blow that one deal. They tell the story. I mean, you know how many times I've told this baseball story? I have no I can't idea. can't even count anymore. <laughs> can't even count anymore because of the effect that it had. Yep. And Steven has told this story, you know, to his buddies and stuff. So it's not just screwing up the one deal when you treat someone like a number. It's future deals as well. I, I, I 100% agree with you. The experience that I had with the college that I was recruited into, that I did go and, and spend four years at, was simply because, and I, I wrote this over and over and over again when, when people asked why I went to Barry College, why I went to the school that I went to. And it was like, well, it, when they recruited me, it felt like home, right? They, they made the experience so fantastic that you know, I, I got into seven different other colleges and nobody from any of those other colleges even called me, right? They didn't even, they didn't even care enough to give me a phone call or do anything other than send me the letter. So I, that's exactly right, that you have to create an experience that is, again, selling different, Right, because people remember that. People won't remember what you did. They'll Absolutely. remember what you said. They'll remember how, how you made them feel. And that's uh, my Angela. I, I, I didn't quote 100%. that. I mean, I, I wish that I was me. Also, know, the, know, <laughs> the parking, the parking uh, uh, conundrum gave me like flashbacks to my college career. <laughs> I was like getting tickets left and right, calling my, calling my parents going, oh, you got a ticket because I parked in the wrong spot. There were seven <laughs> parking spots in the entire parking lot. So uh, yes. I don't know what to tell them. So... I, I but, love but that. Up a good point with that. If you think of your college experience as you're selling those 25 conversations that you have every day, remember that college experience of why you picked the college that you did, because that'll lead these people on the other end of the phone or the other end of the zoom to pick sales gravy. Yep. 100%. I, the, I just had a conversation with a, it, it was just a salesperson at a large client of mine. They, they weren't the person I was selling to. They, Sent, you know, sent me an email because we had done some training with them. And I said, hey, let's just set up a meeting so that we can have a conversation, put a face to a name and uh, and do some quick introductions. I wasn't selling. I didn't, this took up, you know, what, 30 minutes of my time on uh, Friday after, or thir Wednesday afternoon at five o'clock. And he had this whole conversation with me about how there was one of their larger clients. This larger client was uh, a search engine. I'm not going to name which one, but it's the biggest search engine that you use. And they were a client of theirs and called into the sales rep and said, you know, uh, hey, I've been on the 1-800 line for three days just trying to get this service done. Who should I speak with? And the sales rep went, oh, I don't know. Uh, called the 1-800 line again. And then shot. And then after that, just shot them an email back going to customer service. And the guy that I was talking to was on the team and said, oh my God, I can't believe that that's what they did. So he called them. He called that client and said, listen, I don't know how I'm going to help you, but I'm going to be your main point of contact and let's get this figured out. They finally got it figured out. It took them seven days to figure this out. And at the end of the, you know, the conundrum, they, they got whatever it was. He didn't get any commission on it. But then the person said to him, you know, we've got to get rid of X number of documents. Let's go ahead and do that. And it turned into a 2000 or $4,000 deal for him right off the bat, just because he just took the time to give them a call and say, you know, what? I don't know if I can help you, but I'm going to do my best to make that happen. 
right? And that, that was recognition. So same same process. If you think about that college experience, he just gave that to a client and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't college and there weren't any parking issues, but it was, you know, on a larger scale. And uh, if you think of the restaurants that you like going to, you like going to the restaurant where they know who you are, right? You walk in, they know you by name. Perhaps they know your favorite drink. They know what you usually like to order. And we want to keep going back there. And the food may be good, not great, good, but the experience, you're like, you know what? I want to keep coming back here. It's great. I just, there's so many stories. You can think about it. If you are a salesperson, just document those kinds of interactions, right? If you have an interaction with a, with a restaurant or if you think about a person that you are really fond of in a professional setting because they listen to you or they, they gave you a call or someone that you didn't even buy from. Like I've got a state farm guy who's been calling me for months and months and months. And frankly, I have I don't have any reason to, to you know, to take a meeting with him, but he calls me once a month and he just says, Hey Jeb, how are you? How's your apartment? How's your car? Everything going well and makes a connection with me. And I pick up the phone every single time because I know I'm going to have a good conversation with me. And sometimes he just gives me nuggets of information on insurance that I otherwise wouldn't have had. And he let me know that. And you know what? There's probably going to be a time when I'm going to have a need and he's going to be there. So it'll be your first phone call. He'll be my first phone call when I have a need. I think about a restaurant that's down the street from me, the food, it's good. My, my girlfriend gets really mad at me because I love this restaurant. I just love it. It's my favorite place to walk to in the morning. They all know my name. They, they know my order. They, I come sit down. I got my dog with me. They're like, they know my dog's <laughs> name. They, you know, they, they do a fantastic job. And the food is okay. It, I mean, it, it, it truly is. I think I will, I will rave about this restaurant for the rest of my life. They, they, they create an experience for me. I walk in there, I go, man, this food is fantastic. And my girlfriend rolls her eyes. She's like, it's like, it's good, Jeb, but can we go anywhere else? And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> these people take care of me. So I want to talk about the, if you were me strategy, this is something yeah. that I found really compelling in the book. So go through that a little bit too. Okay, sure. So this is a strategy that I'm batting a thousand with. You played baseball. So you know, that means it has worked every single time. I personally guarantee it. And it's a strategy when I've put this in place with clients, succeeds every time. They come away with, with information. So here's how this works. You're gonna pick 10 clients that if you could stick them in a copier as a way to grow the business, you do it in, the, in a heartbeat. Now, I didn't say your biggest clients, I said your best clients, because your biggest clients you may not wanna replicate. You may have a solution with them that you say, ah, that's not really scalable, or maybe they're at a margin level that you don't wanna replicate. 10 clients that if you could stick them in a copier as a way to grow the business, you would do it. And you're going to have a conversation with them. You're not sending an email, not sending a text, not leaving a voicemail, real conversation. And it sounds like this. Jeb, you've been working with us for a number of years, so you're familiar with what we offer and the quality of what we offer. If you were me, what events would you be going to? What conferences would you attend? What associations would you be active in? What would you be reading to meet more people like you? We make sales so much harder than it needs to be. It's an open book test. And you'll be amazed how gracious people are when you ask them that. Now, you're not upselling, you're not asked for a referral. All you're asking them to do in that conversation is take your hat and place it on their head for a moment and provided some counsel. Now, what you'll notice at the end of that, to meet more people like you, it means they're special, right? It gives them a little bit of yeah. well, puff up a little <laughs> bit, right? Because I want to meet more people like you. And the reason for the cues, associations, conferences, events, reading, is to help them think through what those recommendations might be. And I'll share with you a couple of anecdotes from this. So I gave this task to a coaching client and they had two weeks to have 10 conversations and then we were going to have a debrief conversation. Just before we got to the time for that appointment, I get an email from their head of sales saying, uh, apology. Hey, we got really busy over the last couple of weeks. We only got four of these done. Sent the attachment. He had four pages of notes, four pages from four conversations. There was no need to apologize. This is, uh, this is awesome. Another uh, client, this was a, uh, an individual that I was coaching, gave him the, the assignment. 
Again, 10 in two weeks. He got seven of them done. He found out about a technology council in his own backyard with members he had been trying to prospect into and hadn't been able to reach a single one of them. And his client said, by the way, uh, I could bring you as my guest if you'd like. Yeah, I'm in. (laughs) (laughs) And then a couple months ago, he had the opportunity to present to this council to folks that he had been unable to reach otherwise. And one of these times he, he put that if you were me question out there in person with a CEO sitting next to him. CEO didn't know about the strategy. So he poses the if you were me. And then that night I get an email from that CEO saying, this is the question I've been waiting for my whole life. Saw it in action, nearly cried. Thank you. Now, for those of you watching this podcast, what does it cost you to put the if you were me business development strategy in place? Nothing. Nothing. (laughs) So do it today. Pick 10 clients that if you could stick them in a copier as a way to grow the business, you do it in a heartbeat and go have these if you were me conversations. You will be amazed how much you learn from those conversations. Low cost, high reward. It's it's an easy conversation. Those are questions that salespeople are reluctant to ask, but once you ask them again, you bat a thousand because it it, it I love I love how you pose this at the end of that uh, at the end of that sentence. Like you, the reason that it works is because the most insatiable human need is the is the need to feel important, right? And so when you give them the platform and the stage to talk about themselves and how they would interact with themselves, you're giving them the you know that gift of importance. And so then you're not only just learning where you should go and maybe what events you should you should you know attend or what mm-hmm. uh, you know groups you should be involved with. Yeah, you're also learning how to sell to those people. Right, you're learning the language of their business, of their position. We talk about those targeted and ideal accounts, right? And you talk about how many people are inside of a inside of a decision making process. If you do that with different decision makers at different organizations, you start to learn how to have conversations about a copier with fifty, you know, with, with the ability to, sh- to print fifty shades of gray. And you talk to the CFO, and you talk to the IT manager, and you, you talk to the CMO. Right, you're able to have those different conversations because you're learning how to speak to those folks. And that's how you level Absolutely. up your conversations. I'm going to Absolutely. leave you with this, with this question, because we're right at the end of our time and you at the end of your book, I'll, okay, go implement the, uh, the strategy of, if you were me, that's the first one, but other than that strategy. So you have so many concepts inside of your book and you talk about, listen, if you're going to do this, don't do it all at once, because we know as human beings, if you say tomorrow, I'm going to lose 400 pounds, Suddenly, you're never going to lose 400 pounds because that's, that's way right. too much. So do it one chapter at a time. Do it. I, I love the quote you had at the end. You know, do it until you don't get it wrong, as opposed to getting it right. If you were Which to tell is not my quote either, by the way, <laughs> it's not your quote either. But I love that quote. So it's. I mean, it, it it just tells us how we should be. You know, thinking about implementing your strategies. If you were looking at someone today and they were reading your book, what? one, two, or three strategies we just say, you know, go practice those right now other than if you were me. So I'm going to give you one, and it's a big one. It's not just practicing, it's putting it together. Everyone's looking for the holy grail. How do I get more wins, right? How do I close more deals? How do I convert more prospects into sales? And the answer is you don't. That's the finish line. You can't do anything about the finish line What you want to do is brush up your discovery game. And there's a chapter in the book dedicated to putting together an effective discovery. Because we know during discovery, that's when we acquire key information. We position our meaningful differentiators. It's the foundation for the sale. Weak discovery, the whole deal is weak. So if I was going to give you one task coming out of this, this podcast and you read Sell Different, I'd brush up my discovery because if I do a better job there, more solid foundation, get more deals on the back end. I love it. All right. So tell our audience where to find Sell Different and where to find more information about you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, It's in all the major bookstores. Of course, it's on Amazon. It's available in hardcover, Kindle, and audiobook. And if you like listening to my stories and my voice, I am the narrator of the audiobook, which again is something that's different compared to sales differentiation, where I did not do the audiobook. Uh, they had a narrator do it. 
Um, wherever you get the book, go to selldifferentbook.com, selldifferentbook.com. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, you can go there and download a sample. You can read the first chapter or even listen to the first chapter. But wherever you buy the book, you're eligible for the video series that I've created that goes along with it. You just have to buy a copy for yourself. Go to selldifferentbook.com and sign up. And every week for a year, you'll get an email from me with a link to a video helping you implement the strategies that you've read about. Boom. All right, everyone. Go f- do that research. Go find Lee's videos. Go buy this book. It's fantastic. It will help you sell different. And if you're interested in meeting more folks like Lee, go to outboundconference.com. He hangs out there. He's got some great sessions and it's a great place to meet other folks who are passionate about what they do in the sales profession and leveling up yourself with a community of people who really care about what they do. So outboundconference.com, we've got early bird specials going to the end of the year. So check those out. Otherwise, this is uh, Jeb Jr. signing off from the Sales Gravy Podcast in the, in, in the Blue Room here at Sales Gravy Studios. Thank you so much, Lee, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye, everyone. Ooh.